So welcome to Beauty of Colors podcast, Epiphany. It's great to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it and uh, looking forward to our conversation today. You're very welcome. So Epiphany, tell us about you and what is your story? Um, wow. I mean, I my story has a lot of parts because uh, I just turned 60. So I've been through three or four different lifetimes, probably. But um, the thing that you and I connected about is that for the past 10 years or so, I've been practicing and thinking and writing about uh, the topic of human touch, specifically non-sexual touch, or as I like to call it, nurturing human touch. And uh, when I was living in Austin before the pandemic, I had a hands-on touch business where it would be a it was kind of ritualized and it was done with two practitioners and the person who was coming in to, to see us felt like a king or queen getting waited on and you know having all of their needs um, attended to and it was just very relaxing and nurturing um uh and a while after I had been having the business, I realized that a lot of the people who needed it the most could afford it the least. And so I ended up writing a book about non-sexual touch called Somebody Hold Me, The Single Person's Guide to Nurturing Human Touch. And it was designed to get uh, to teach single people how to get tender touch when they weren't in a romantic relationship because it's, it's hard. And then the pandemic hit and... Uh, putting my hands on people, you know, hugging them and touching them closely was not a good idea. And so I decided to go back to graduate school and I got a master's in public health. And in my, I, I, yeah, I was, I was interested in public health because I wanted to create public health programs that used human touch as a wellness practice, because, you know, we don't really talk about it or think about it that way a lot. And so in my statement of purpose for grad school, I said that human touch has a branding problem. The way that we think about it doesn't work for most of us. And so um, before I graduated, my uh, faculty advisor was like, okay, well, you say you want to rebrand human touch. So how would you go about doing that? So I did a bunch of research on it and um, kind of came up with a um, a framework for doing the rebrand and interviewed people. I interviewed um, single middle-aged women who still wanted to be in a romantic relationship and were having a hard time with that. And um, from there, the, the framework I had used was storytelling and brand archetypes. And from there, I was able to figure out what the three archetypes that we think about touch it with now are. And then based on what they said, four ways, four archetypes that we could use to rebrand human touch that would make it more accessible, inclusive and inclusive. And um, yeah, that's, uh, that's my story thus far. And I'm sticking to it. So. Okay. So Epiphany, what is the Karuna session and how does that change someone's life? Did I say it right? Karuna. It's Karuna. Karuna. Corona yeah. mm -hmm. um, it was, it was really beautiful. I, I really miss doing it. And I think about my like, gosh, oh, should I reopen that business? So basically what it was is um, it was very ritualized because, you know, the idea of having a stranger touch you is a big deal for a lot of people. So the person would come in, we had a really beautiful space to work in and the person would come in and um, we'd have them take off their shoes and turn off their phone and just relax. And then we'd bless them and wash their feet and ask them to meditate. Um, we'd ask them to change into a ritual garment and we'd talk about boundaries and what they were dealing with. And then we'd have them lay down on the bed. And it was always done with two practitioners because it takes away from that idea of that if one person's touching another person that, you know, that they're going to have sex right? Because that's what we normally think about. And so we do very light touch on their front and then their back. And then we would put the client in between us in a way that on their side and one of us would hold them from the back and the other one would be in the front. So they were kind of sandwiched in between two people. And um, the idea was to mimic the feeling of being held by your mother as an infant, because your body knows that feeling it's you know how oh, this is what it's like to feel cared for and loved and safe and 
um, you know, nurtured and just, you know, that they could really relax. And um, by the time the session was done, they were usually a, like a lump of jello on the bed. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'd get up, we'd let them lie there for a few minutes. A lot of times people would fall asleep. And then we'd have them get up and get dressed and serve them tea and cookies on the couch and send them on their way. So yeah, it was, um, it was, it was a really beautiful, and it was also deeply satisfying as a practitioner to provide that people. Like I, I loved working with mothers because they're giving that all the time, but they're not necessarily getting it back. So I know we're talking about human touch, um, epiphany, but when someone touches you, um, what part of the body do you allow the person to touch you in order for it not to be sexual? Um, is it the hands, the feet? What exact? What part? What parts of the body? That's a great question, and it's it's something that people get hung up on. Um, I mean, if you're if you're hugging somebody, you can put your arms all the way around them and touch their back, but um, yeah, hands, feet, um, you know, having somebody put their hand on your shoulder, they can touch your face or your hair. Um, you know, I mean, uh, like, you know, going and getting a, a pedicure, or getting your hair cut when they're like washing your hair, people are like, oh, this feels so good. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that kind of stuff. Feet a little bit. Some people are weird about their feet and some people aren't. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes I like to have somebody put their hand on my heart or my back. Um, you know, it depends to um, where you are, the relationship with the person. It's it's tricky, but you know, gen generally speaking, like if you'd stay away from anywhere where you'd wear a bikini, mm -hmm. you're pretty good. But it, it's it's always you know it's 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 highly individual. You know, like I said, like somebody may like to hold hands, but the idea of somebody give them a foot rub, they're like, ah, no. So, you know, it's always better to just ask. So it's, so with the, the opposite sex, and if one person is attracted to the person that touch, they're touching, wouldn't that kind of lead to a sexual touch instead of just being just a normal touch? Um, That's a great question too. Uh, it depends. I mean, you know, if, if somebody, well, if somebody was romantically interested in me and I wasn't interested in them, like maybe I would give them a hug in a, in a uh, public place or be like, you know, um, I'm okay with holding hands, but that's it. Um, but probably if somebody, if somebody, if I, if I kind of felt the, you know, that somebody was trying to push it into that place and I didn't want it, I would probably, avoid touch altogether, which is one of the reasons that so many of us are touch starved because we don't, we don't think about touch just as, you know, something for comfort or connection. You know, it's like, because we equate sex with touch, which is kind of uh, one of uh, touch's current brands. It, you know, it's like, it, it doesn't, it can't mean anything else, you know? And so it's, it's frustrating. Right. Yeah. So, how do we design the future with human touch? Okay. So I think the first thing that we need to do is look at where we're at with it right now. And when I was talking to people, one of the, one of the questions I asked them was, you know, if you're looking at the media or, you know, social media or seeing your friends or having conversations, I'm like, you know, what are the, the stories that we're currently telling about touch? And, you know, the first one that we talked about, obviously, is that you touch people that you're sexually or romantically involved in. Um, and so that doesn't work for a lot of people. There's in the United States, like 30 percent of us or so are single. We're not in a relationship. We're not living together. Um people in relationships, something like 15% of marriages are sexless, you know, people haven't had sex in the past year. Or so, you know, being in a relationship and being married doesn't mean that you'll get sex. And, you know, married people have this idea of touch equals sex too, that, you know, that if they're gonna, um, you know, if, if, if one partner doesn't want to have sex and the other one touches them, like goes in for a hug, they're like, get off of me, you know, I don't, you know, cause they think that they're gonna, 
try and work it up. So that's one. Um, the second one is touch as caregiver, you know, the kind of touch that we share with our children, you know, like it's, it's super, it's actually like one of the things that helps infants with their neurological development. Um, the problem with that often comes with parents that, um, especially mothers, um, that a lot of times they'll talk about being touched out, which is that, um, you know, like their, their kids are touching them all the time, but it's like, give me, give me, give me. And it's not like, oh, here, mommy, let me take care of you. So, um, you know, it's that touch as caregiver is like very one-sided and very selfless, you know, and it's like, you know, the mothers are like, hey, what about me? And then the last one is touch as villain. You know, we have so much unwanted, unwelcome touch, you know, the, um, I think it's, one in four girls is sexually abused as a child. Um, you know, one in four women or so are raped or sexually assaulted. You know, that doesn't even, that doesn't even cover stuff like, you know, like walking down the street and having somebody grab you or, you know, like pushing into you on, on public transportation or something. Um, you know, people get, all kinds of unwanted touch, you know, and it's like, if we don't talk about that, then it makes it hard to go anywhere further with it. So to move forward, um, what I kind of got from my people that I interviewed was there were four new archetypes or ways of thinking about it. The first one is touch is revolutionary, um, which is that you know, it's, it's a radical idea to think about like sharing touch with your friends. I mean, at this point in my life, I would rather have an awkward conversation with a friend and see if, you know, like a female friend to see if they wanted to cuddle than you know, going out on an awkward date with somebody that I'm going to like get home and be like, yeah, no, I don't ever want to see you again kind of thing. Um, and one of the things like I, I'm, I've been kind of led a very rebellious life throughout, but one of the things that I love about it is, you know, we have this idea in America about rugged individualism, that every person can take care of themselves. And this is a way to be kind and tender and care about each other and connect with each other and take care of each other. That's very, very simple. Uh, the second uh, way of rethinking touch is touch as a magician, um, which is thinking about the, the very, very transformative nature of touch. That transformative was a word that came up a lot um, with these women that I were interviewing who were like, yeah, I really want touch in my life. And, you know, like when I go out with my friends and I get a really, really good long hug, it's just like, it changes my entire day. And, um, I think that this idea of, um, touch is transformative can be really helpful if you're, if you're healing from some sort of boundary crossing, um, or trauma, um, you know, where you're very, uh, worried about touch, you know, because you're, you don't know which way it's going to go. And it's like, if it's done in this very safe and structured environment, then, you know, and you can go, Oh wait, wow, this actually feels good. Or no, I don't like that. Can you stop? And having the person stop, um, is something that I think could be really helpful and really healing for a lot of people. Uh, the third one is touch as seeker or explorer. Um, which is where somebody says, you know, okay, like, let's say somebody gets divorced and, you know, one of the things was they were in a sexless marriage or they didn't get as much touch as they want. And they're like, okay, I want to do things different. And so it's allowing themselves to work through different ideas, you know, different beliefs that they might have around touch, um, you know, exploring the health benefits, just kind of taking the time to really figure out for themselves, like how they would do it differently or what they wanted differently. And then the fourth archetype um, that people was really appealing to the women that I interviewed was touch as caregiver, but 2.0, it's kind of a refresh where the focus is on using touch to caregive, you know, like if, 
like if I have a friend who's a new mom, for instance, and I go over to their house and I rub their feet or, you know, just cuddle them the way that they're cuddling their babies all the time, um, then it allows them to be cared for instead of doing all the caring. So I would kind of describe that as like making a deposit in your overdrawn nurturing bank account. So, mm, wow, <laughs> I like that. So Epiphany, um, I know you talked about your book and you said the name of the book. Um, where can the listeners get in touch with you? Where can they get a copy of the book? Um, what services do you offer? I know you talked about it. How can the listeners participate in the theory of human touch? Sure. Um, so there's a couple of different things. My my website is nurturinghumantouch.com. Uh, unfortunately, Karuna Sessions is not going right now. Um, I, I may start it up again. It's something I'm I'm thinking about a lot because, like I said, I I really really enjoyed providing the service. It was it was very um, deeply satisfying on an emotional and spiritual level. I loved it. Uh, the book you can get on Amazon or you know Borders or Barnes and Noble. You can order it online. It's um, in print. It's on. Um, you know, uh, you can get it on an e-reader, um, you can get, it's also an audio book. Um, and the book's actually probably a great way for people to participate in this idea of shifting how they think around touch to begin with, because the book is actually set up as kind of a DIY workshop so that you could do it with your friends. Um, but there's all kinds of practical tips and tricks in there for starting conversations and, you know, figuring out what your own stuff is around touch. You know, if you're, if it's something that you don't like, you know, figuring out why, and are you okay with that? Do you want less touch in your life? You know, cause that's, that's an issue for some people too. They get more than they actually want. Um, right now, I, one of the things I was able to do in school was getting trained as a health and wellness coach. So I'm offering coaching services for people around human touch as well. Um, I really like to be able to do that, you know, kind of walking people through some different scenarios and, you know, figuring out if there are people in their lives that, they could do this with, or, you know, do they need to go to a professional? Is there, you know, some sort of thing that they can figure out, you know, how to play with boundaries, how to ask. Um, so that's been, that's been really fun and exciting to, to do with people because it's, it's deeply personal and deeply individual. So, you know, everybody else is going to, everybody's going to have a different journey towards it. And um, my next book that I want to write, I haven't started yet, but um, I want to do a book on non-sexual touch for couples because, you know, you can be in a romantic relationship and this is still a problematic era area of people's relationships. So I want to be able to have some resources for people on that as well. Wow. And um, I, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, I said, sounds good. Go yeah. Ahead. Do you have, um, is there anything else that um, I didn't answer of your questions or? No, you did. You covered it all. Um, do you have any last words for the listeners? Um, what would you say to someone who is lonely and seeking human connection? Mm -hmm. um, that's a great question. Uh, a great, if, if they have people in their lives that they might be able to share touch with, um, like a great question that's kind of an, an icebreaker that's always really surprising to people is um, asking people, what does touch mean to you? You know, because it, you know, everybody assumes that touch means the same thing to every single person that they come across and it doesn't, you know, it's like, I mean, like I, I know couples who cuddle all the time, but they don't have sex. And then I know other couples who, have lots of great sex, but they don't cuddle, you know, so it's like clearly touch doesn't mean the same thing or, you know, touch could mean, um, you know, I, I want to like snuggle up with my kid on the couch and watch a movie or touch could mean, 
man, anytime my dad was touching me when I was growing up, it was because he was trying to hit me. You know, it's like people, people are just all over the place. Um, and I would say if people don't have access to that, there are professional cuddlers out there who do it for a living or even just, you know, the, the, the quote unquote, except transaction ways of doing it, like, um, you know, going and getting a pedicure or, um, you know, just even like some hairdressers, you can go in and they'll like wash and style your hair um, or, you know, getting a massage. There's also like dance classes, um, partner yoga, things like that. I mean, there's, there's lots of ways to get creative about it, but um, I really urge people to look at their personal networks and the resources that we already have. You know, if you already have friendships that are solid with, you know, people that you love and trust and care about, and they feel the same way as you, then um, I think it's worth it to try and at least have those awkward conversations, even if it doesn't go anywhere, you know, to get people thinking differently about it for themselves. So it's a, it's a long process. So, yeah. Wow. Nicely said, Epiphany. Well, Epiphany, thank you for being on Beauty of Colors podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Cleanne. And um, yeah, I uh, look forward to seeing what you do in the future with your podcast. It's been really cool so far. Thank you so much.